Hi, everyone. Hi. Happy Sunday. Um, it is 10 a.m. in the morning by me, but it is well in the afternoon for Charlotte over in the UK. Nine o'clock. It's just summertime. <laughs> there we go. Um, so we are here to discuss the group read for the Herstoriathon. This is kind of the last hurrah for the readathon before hopefully we do it again next year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. More fun, more prompts, more activities, and the like. Um, but I figured we could, first of all, Charlotte, you can introduce yourself, and then we can start giving our initial thoughts on what is called the women's history of the modern world in the U.S. and rebel women in the U.K. So mm -hmm. I'll let you introduce yourself. What am I saying? <laughs> Like, who am I? <laughs> um, I'm Charlotte. I'm a <laughs> I don't yeah. know what else to say. She is a lover of history like me. Yeah. That <laughs> and I think where we differ, I'm more, um, I, I suppose I'm more early modern mm -hmm. in my interest. I would say so, yeah. Queen Which Matilda. Not held true. not how <laughs> true for the books that I've read for history -thon. Oh, I've, I've realized aside from um, the books that I've read that are like multiple women, mm -hmm. I've not read any book that is about an individual woman that is pre 1800. So I'm like, that is... what do I get? Do I get the, the tick on that for the, the books that are multiple women? Oh, that is interesting because I would have. No, I would have thought differently. And I'm like looking for my phone because I'm like, what books? Oh, what books did I read? Maybe we can do that quickly. What books did yeah. you manage to read I mean, for her storyathon? I've been really terrible at actually. I, I started a lot of things for her storyathon, and I think out of, I, I think I've, I, I did my wrap up this uh, this morning, and I I finished sixteen books total for the month, which I think is very good that's for me. Amazing, because uh, that's basically what I've read for the entire year so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, but only but only five of them that were finished were her storyathon and I don't know how that uh, happened. Interesting. Part, part of it was I started reading Women's Prize long list books. Ah, uh, um, yes, so that I do it. Because uh, that was announced on the eighth of March, and I was like, "Well, I must read these books." That um, is true. But I started. I did start a lot of things, and I oh, bought okay. a lot of things. That well, it was also your birthday right? month. It was. It was also. <laughs> So that's allowed. That's definitely allowed. For me, what did I read for the readathon? I read Gentleman Jack, which I know you oh. also read. Um, okay. And then I read The Rebel Nun, which is more in your area of like historical Ooh. expertise than mine. Um, and then I read The Tsarina's Daughter. And I started and got about 50% through A Well-Behaved Woman. Um, but I'm not finished with it yet. And then, of course, I read The Women's History of the Modern World. So yeah. I got a few books done, but not as many as I had anticipated. Yeah, I am. Um, so mine were uh, Gentleman Jack, same as you. Um, I had The Woman They Could Not Silence by Kate Moore. Oh, uh, how was that? Was it good? That was it. It was good. Um, I, I do think I prefer The Radium Girls. And I do think mm. it, it's a it's a very long book for how what it is telling. I think the thing about the Radium Girls is you've got multiple stories going on, multiple mm -hmm. women that's being focused on, whereas this is literally just Elizabeth Packard. Um, okay. And you, there, are, there are times where I like, this could be a good like 150 pages shorter than it is. Oh, okay. that's it's fair. Still it is still very interesting, but the weapons yeah. were like, but it's, she's, she's very, she's a very good, um, like with the Radium Girls, she's very good at uh, taking this non, uh, this, history um and even though it's non-fiction making it feel like a narrative so it flows mm -hmm. really nicely oh well that's good yeah um which i think wouldn't work for some people who want their their non-fiction to be very much like here are my sources boom 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 yeah uh, so if you want if you're a bit shy with non-fiction and non mm -hmm. it's a good like bridge into it yeah that's what i've always said about radium girls too is that i felt like yeah. it bridged the gap um for people who are newer to non-fiction or maybe intimidated by it yeah. Um, like that always felt like a good sort of way to introduce yourself to, especially I think history nonfiction, because that reads a lot different from other types of nonfiction that are out there. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. Especially the more like academic you go, the more it is very much like 
boom, 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 yeah. here, are, here are my sources. And you and make, that's not necessarily what you want when you're first getting into it. No, um, definitely not. Yeah, I think it's more, I think she's a very accessible history writer. Mm-hmm. Um, I read a, a historical fiction book that I read was The Language of Food by Annabelle Abbs, which has become one of my favourite books of this year. Ooh. Um, I, I, like, I expected I was going to like it, but I didn't think I was going to love it. Um, mm-hmm. and it's about um, Eliza Acton, who wrote... Oh, what's the full title? I'm getting, getting the full title of her cookbook. She wrote <laughs> she wrote a cookbook called Modern Cookery for Private Families. Okay. But, this is, but she wasn't initially a cook herself. Uh, okay. She was a poet and she was trying to get published. And they were like, women poets? What, a, what, a, what is that? Um, and, they, and her publisher recommended that she wrote a cookbook. And she was like, but I don't cook. <laughs> and they're like, well, you're Problem. You're probably- they were like, your writing is really good, but this is not what the market wants. We need a cook. What we need is a cookbook that is very like clear in its method um, mm-hmm. and makes sense because a lot of like I did my dissertation on 18th century cookbooks and they are a bit of a mess. <laughs> the fun yeah. to read, but a bit of a mess. Um, no. And so it was like it's this story about her bringing on um, a young working class woman called Anne Kirby um, to be her assistant, and they form this friendship and they create this cookbook together because she's a really passionate cook so they're learning from each other and this it's it's so good it is so good that does sound Um, really good and it's it's ways that their lives like parallel in terms of like uh what's expected of them as women but then also because there's the very clear class difference um and her and experience of life is very different to eliza's in lots of different ways and it bats backwards and forwards between the two women's perspectives and okay. I, re- I really liked it and it has Ooh. a beautiful color as well which is not <laughs> it's my favorite always- it's white white with like blue um oh blue that's blue. always a nice look my favorite thing in the whole world <laughs> that's a nice look it's even on your shirt it looks like today oh my, my shirt is mickey mouse is it Mickey Mouse? It looks yeah. blue from far away. I was like, it, it looks like flowers. <laughs> this is this is why I wear it on a lot of like Zoom work meetings, and people are like, "Ah, oh, okay, yeah, that, I, like, I, I like get it. away with it." <laughs> <laughs> I, love I don't think it. anybody would actually care at my work. They're they're pretty no. pretty chill. Um, and then uh, da, da, da. Um, and then also bookish broads, which was the, like a collected. Um, mm-hmm. It's like it's about uh, women writers from. I want to say like early medieval to present day. Okay. Um, and it gives you a short biography uh, of their lives, like one or two pages. But mm-hmm. the, the thing that I like it for is that the, the, the illustrations, they have like portraits that are ah. like very bright and colorful. And I want, I want to buy some of these and put them on my wall because they're so beautiful. And I, actually, like I, that. I rate it more for the, the illustrations than I do for the writing, which seems a bit harsh, but... <laughs> it's fair. It, it's uh, fair, though. Fair assessment. Um, but yeah, that was that was really interesting. But I, the thing I had with that was like, there were some of the some of the writers who I did know like bits and pieces about, but I didn't know a lot about their lives. But for mm-hmm. the ones I did know, I noticed because it obviously you're always going to have to simplify simplify things to squeeze somebody's entire life and works into right. a page. A few pages, yeah. Yeah, but for some of them, I was like, yeah, but some of this is just wrong. There's just like little bits and pieces here that it's just inaccurate. So like Jane Austen, yep. I was all over. Oh, of course. Thinking about Pride and Prejudice, I was like, that's just not right. That's just incorrect. <laughs> um, so I was like, oh. if that's what she's getting wrong about Jane Austen, what's she getting wrong about these other the people? The others. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was still good. I think it's like, I wouldn't write it off as like an introduction to these women if you've never okay. learned about them. Okay. Um, and once again, I want them to open a shop where I can buy like an Etsy shop so I can buy those prints. That's those fair. Prints. We do love Etsy shops for their for their artwork. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I've been treating myself to uh, with my birthday month was uh, getting some prints for my office. Um, oh, nice. And, uh, Etsy has come to save my life. <laughs> I love Etsy artwork. It's just the best. Um, so I think this is a good segue because like the book that you were just talking about, the women's history of the modern world and rebel women is kind kind of gives you like vignettes, I like to call them, or very brief biographies of women for, throughout the last 200 some odd years because it really starts with the French Revolution and surprisingly went up 
very far more recent than I thought it mm. would because like it talks about like Trump being elected and all of that, which I was not expecting. So it's a little more than 200 years. Um, but what were your like initial thoughts on the book? What did you rate it? Like, what did you like? What did you dislike, if anything? Yeah, for me, this was like, it was a solid four star for me. Okay. Um, it wasn't it wasn't one because I feel like for a five star, it would it would have to really sink into my soul and like teach mm -hmm. me a lot of stuff I didn't already know. Um, and there were definitely like women in this that I either didn't know a lot about or hadn't heard of before. But I right. feel like a lot of people that she went back to were it's like it very just people that you hear about a lot and maybe mm -hmm. you don't know. And, and it's a good one, I think, for as an introduction. Um, mm -hmm. I think you could um, you could follow this quite easily. And she has a very um, I, I like her voice. She's got a very she she gives you the information, but she also has a bit of personality. In yeah, um, yeah. Like she'll make little comments, which I find quite funny. Um, yeah. But. Um, yeah, the fact that you are jumping from people like every few pages um, just means it can't go into as much depth as you might want it to. Yeah, but yeah, still, I would agree. Like, it, it covers a lot in about, what is it, 300, 400 pages? Yeah, um, it's, I think it's, my, it's a good book of it. Yeah, I think mine is like just over 350 pages, this edition, um, without the like notes or anything at the end. Um, I would say that this for me, I think I gave it 3.5 stars. I do agree that I feel like it's a good primer. It's almost like what you would expect like a history 101 course at a university to be like if it was titled history of the modern, like mo women's history of the modern world, like this is what you'd expect. Like you're not doing any deep dive into any particular person or any particular era. It's really just giving you a survey of everything that you they feel is important. I did really like her voice. Um, and so I do think that it's, it wasn't an approachable book, especially for someone if you're not into nonfiction, because she does have personality to it. There's a, there's a little sassiness, some of her like parentheticals, um, or her italicized portions where you're just like, yeah, she's having a lot of fun right now. Mm -hmm. Like you, you get that sense. So there's um, some joy, I think in the overall writing of it. I think for me, the, I feel like the beginning of the book felt a little bit more like a narrative, like history. And then when we get into more modern times, I want to say probably late 19th to the 20th and 21st century, it did start to feel a little bit more like giving you biographies on all of these different women and not necessarily making that bridge or those connections to them it's just like oh let's talk about all of these really fabulous women um which I thought was interesting but it felt a little weighted differently um yeah. from the beginning of the book overall and I do think that one of probably the reason I didn't personally give it four stars was just because I do think it kind of lacked a little intersectionality mm -hmm. overall um which is something that I'm a little bit more aware of. Probably if I read this book five years ago, I probably would have given it four or five stars. Yeah. Um, but also, it was like, how I don't know if Rosalind Miles, a white heteronormative female, would be the authority for intersectionality on race um, or LGBTQ plus issues, which she touches upon, but in, in no massive detail. Yeah, definitely. So, so that no, to me i've um i i can't help because i've i've just finished reading this is a completely different book but i think it does <clears> similar <throat> as um yeah i've just finished reading power and thrones by dan jones which okay. is this massive sweeping history of the medieval period mm -hmm. um, and he's and you know it is like an 800 page book but he's going through things like boom 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 and having to give you as much information as he can, but like within a couple of pages for each thing. Right. And I think when you're talking about how, how this book is weighted, I can't help but compare it because I feel like he does do a very good job of like even, you can tell where he's probably got more expertise in, mm -hmm. but I think he, 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 I think he is very leveled in how he approaches that massive like thousand year period and giving each bit its, 
the necessary time to mm -hmm. really digest it before moving on to the next thing um, yeah where it, rather than like just okay I really like this figure so I'm going to talk about them for a lot longer than I did these other people mm -hmm. and I, I also went to see a talk with him where he was talking about um about like he did he he does to, it is mainly western europe that he's talking about but he mm -hmm. does touch upon um um oh, where did my brain go he does touch upon like um other places as well but he doesn't go into america he doesn't oh, go wow. into australia or africa as a right continent. and he was talking about the reason he didn't do that is that he just doesn't know enough about and that that's he he knows that there's importance on doing that and maybe he just it would take him another 20 years to get to the research level to do that justice right um, but that it would go for another per it would have to be another person probably who's got better expertise and I, that, I think it brings up a really interesting question if like what what do you do do you give do you give a history a, a history that is not as in-depth and not mm -hmm. as well researched as it could be right to it or not i don't know I, I think it needs to be out now <laughs> yeah kind of yeah for um, sure and the fact that it's not in a book that is very that is going to get a lot of people's eyes on it i don't yeah. know i don't know it's a very I feel, I feel like it's i want i want that book now yes but, but for modern history and for medieval i want there to be something that has that kind of traction and recognition and popularity um, i do too but I also wouldn't want a figure to a figure like Dan Jones to do like a, a, a just very like I don't know what the word is just a very lackluster history when somebody right. else could do it so much better. Yeah. Um, but I still want it. I want it now. Yeah. No. I mean, I, it. I think too. Like I, I think even in the preface of this, maybe um, Rosalind Miles mentions that a lot of her focus in this is on sort of the Western world as like a concept um and she does kind of touch upon like i was actually really fascinated by when she started talking about australia which yeah like has never really been part of the history i have learned because like it it we're americans so we it was either the us or europe australia is kind of just off there hanging out in the ocean doing its own thing um but she did have interesting information about that um and so i was i was glad to see it um but she acknowledged kind of where her weaknesses were which i appreciate and i think if you as an author can say i know this should be part of the story but it is not something that i am an expert in so i'm not going to try like i'm not going to try to half ass it for lack of a better word just to That's appease what I was you. Trying to get at. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna let someone who can actually write this and do it justice. Like I think as long as you acknowledge it, I'm yeah. comfortable with it. It's when you pretend like there isn't this other stuff mm -hmm. that should be included. And you're like, no, this is this is everything. This is the whole history. You don't need to look further. Then I'm just like, well, you're being a an idiot so i don't like you but yeah so apparently she acknowledged that in the preface um yeah. which i never read the preface because i'm always scared it's going to spoil something as an english lit major i stopped reading all of those things because they always spoiled what was going to happen in the book no they just, at the beginning of books yeah they just assume that you like know exactly what's going down in a book and even though in nonfiction you have less of that to worry with it's just now a habit and i'm just like i'm not doing it no nope. <laughs> yeah i am um, no i think it's i think the 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 what's the word no i think you need they need to be more push on i think publishers rather mm -hmm. than individual historians to be like you need to be going out and seeking yeah these voices and these histories rather than just giving the same the same people who do the same who retread the same kinds of history again and again yeah and you need yeah. to market it and push it out there because i'm sure there are some fantastic books on like wider world history that's not just very western that are being that are coming out but we're just not hearing about them because they're not being pushed out yeah. and there are some yeah. great voices that could get so much praise and recognition and we're not seeing it um, yeah no I would agree 
bloody hell. And, and it's yeah, it's interesting what um what is covered because uh, because we did we definitely at my school we like we learned about it was always like and then we sent convicts to Australia and that yeah. was and it was always <laughs> convicts to the British Empire and mm-hmm. that was it and it's like yeah hey interesting interesting yeah. and even at uni I didn't we I, we didn't learn much oh there wasn't really much of an option to do Australian yeah, yeah. it was very lacking so this was it was like a very good um like little introduction to that yeah and Another, I found that interesting yeah Another thing because I basically I, I finished reading this about three weeks ago and I finished it yesterday <laughs> I, and I think you've probably got a better you, you've got a better chance of remembering things than I do. Uh, but I've been I was listening to um, the audiobook this morning just to give myself a bit of a refresher. And, yeah. And I just finished where she's talking about uh, where she's talking about foot binding. Which oh I yes. Had, I did know about. I did know about, but I didn't know the aspect of. Um, I didn't know the aspect of the. the, the they said it would make. Um, sexual pleasure better for men because of how women have to walk yes. tighten, they said that it would tighten their muscles so it yes i did not know that aspect i knew that i did not was, either i, I did knew not. i knew that it was meant to be a symbol of well she doesn't have to work she is that mm-hmm. wealthy i understood yeah. that i knew yeah. that I did not know <laughs> the sexual aspect no. of and, <laughs> and i think it's funny because it's probably based on when last like that was brought up in a class for me like Mm -hmm. that would have been world history in like freshman or sophomore year of high school so Mm -hmm. I was like 13 or 14 maybe 15 and I bear in mind I also went to a catholic school so anything that had to do with sex was definitely not going to be brought up so I feel like that was just like (laughs) no it's it's just to make their feet small and (laughs) but yeah (laughs) Um, that was interesting and eye-opening. I did not know that little fact. But yeah, it's, I think what this was, had, was good for was things that I did know, but also giving a different mm-hmm. um, a different spin on it or a different bit of nugget of information that I didn't already know. So definitely, yes. even with like figures or just topics that she was talk- touching on, I still felt like I, I was getting value from reading this. Which is- yeah, yeah, no, I, d- I did too. And actually... Um, it was interesting because I wouldn't say that the French Revolution is a time period that I know particularly well, um, but it's always been one that's interested me because I, I, I like revolutions um, and that sort of thing, hence why I study Russian, um, which is they have a revolution every like couple really? of generations, it seems like. Um, so, so I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, but I I liked how they Rosalind Mild used this kind of as like the starting point of like what she considered modern history and talking about um, like even the sort of groups that the women created like these almost like salons of these sort of rebel women using the title of your book um, and just how involved they seem to be in the in the French Revolution, which I didn't really know. And then things kind of under Napoleon start shifting backwards, like one step forward, two steps back. Um, I really did not have a sense that the Napoleonic Code had really caused that much harm to women in particular over the course of the next few centuries, where it's basically remained in effect to some extent. So that was interesting to me. Yeah, I feel like for me, a lot of my French Revolution knowledge comes from learning about women. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, learning about Mary Wollstonecraft, especially because she was there yeah. around the time, and, um, like, her witnessing, like, people that she knew being guillotined and yeah. having to keep a low profile because she's an English writer um, in a place where they're not really wanting them to be around. No. <laughs> um, and people like... I know, I think also like uh, Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, she was in France around the same time, mm-hmm. and like she knew Marie Antoinette. Yeah. Um, so that's also, obviously like we learned it, it, learned about it, but that's where most of my interest has come from is like learning about people's experiences. Yeah, yeah. More so than like nitty gritty of the politics and like. Yeah, that. I would say the same thing too because I I feel like I learned about it basically because of 
someone like Marie Antoinette or because of um, who became Josephine Bonaparte, Napoleon's wife, um, because she very narrowly escaped being guillotined. Um, and like finding out about that like upheaval and everything that she went through. But again, it wasn't really focused on the politics of it or sort of the reaction to the revolution that the Napoleonic Code ended up being. So that to me was was pretty cool. And I do think that that choosing the French Revolution as kind of the beginning of modern history makes sense, which I know a lot of people do. Um, but that to me made a lot of sense for the starting point of this book. Yeah. Definitely. Were there? I think, because I think people kind of, where they place their modern history, kind of I think some some go um uh, Amer American mm -hmm. uh, wars some people go the, the very big big industrial revolution <laughs> yes when when when, when. when. Um, pick a date pick a year <laughs> um, so no I did like I did like French Revolution uh, as a as a starting as a starting point um but also there's a part, part of me because I am more early modern where I'm just like, but I want to talk about some eight, some more 18th century people. But we that's can't. fair. Fine. Fine. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny. I mean, were there any parts of like other other moments in the book, kind of like the foot binding section that you found particularly striking? Um, like, because I feel like those are the things that even like a few weeks later, you probably are just like, I. I'm still thinking about that one sentence or that one phrase or whatever that transpired at some point. Yeah. Were there any others? Uh, I'm getting back to. I mean, I think because I, I think the first for me right now the first hundred pages or so are the freshest because I have just mm -hmm. listened to, Listen to them. <laughs> and, and I am. Um, I I did. I did. Can I just say I did read this book? It's just it's been a while. It, it's I've been a while. It's okay. <laughs> It's all good. Um, yeah. Um, so we're, so in that, um, there was the chapters on um, bringing women to Australia, which mm -hmm. we just spoke about. And that I found, yeah. I think that that's striking, as we say, because we didn't learn a lot about that. Yeah, and I would say the same. You know, just imprisoning women and sending them off because you need women. Yes. Um, and just doing what you want with them. And that, just that image makes me feel a bit <laughs> yeah things um and it's just for me it's like repeated instances of um like women wanting uh, fighting for their rights and then but because other things are going on like the society being like no 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 or no. you're being a detractor to the most important thing which is basically um, what happened with the first world war it was just like yeah. okay women moving forward trying to get that right to vote and then it's like oh sorry the war broke out so we really need you to focus on the war effort yeah but it repeats in the french revolution and it repeats mm -hmm. in uh, conversations about um about uh, abolition of slavery Mm -hmm. where you can see so many parallels here and there and it's obviously different experiences but it's but people are saying no no you're not important the, you're detracting mm -hmm. from um and it's like it's all it's all bad mm -hmm. can't you see yeah, yeah it's like why can we only focus on one thing and not there are many we, we there, are, there, it's, there it's, are so it's, many it's, things that we can focus on it's like at the same time <laughs> I'm just gonna say, men and multitasking, it's like something that <laughs> you always hear about. And I make fun of my father because he's like, multitasking isn't a thing, Brittany. People don't multitask. And I'm like, women multitask all the time. <laughs> we literally get into arguments about it. I'm just like, yeah, the men lean the world. We're just like, yeah, no, we can't, we can't handle these two things at once. Um, but yeah, no. Which is all connected. Mm -hmm. And what and so in so many of these instances like one like supporting one supports the other yeah so, yeah um yeah but it, just different moments like that and i think also uh like it's interesting certain sections that i found myself like latching onto so mm -hmm. so i was listening um uh focusing a lot on the um ava peron section because we're doing a beta oh nice so, so i was just like hello 
that guy thank you literally <laughs> as i was reading just kept hearing don't cry for me argentina in my head yeah um not not the madonna version the patty lapone version so then it was like belting in my ear um and i'm just like this is very distracting okay like super super distracting yeah. this um, is what my brain does when it's when it, especially when it's a history like this and you're jumping from different point to different point i think my brain has to attach itself onto something i've i already know like that yeah um, and that really like focuses yeah, this is a, this is definitely a concentration issue for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was it was interesting. I feel like there were a couple parts that my brain kind of latched onto. One of the I know there was one po point in the book where I was just like, Rosalind Miles, you did me dirty, because um, it's the one mention of Catherine the Great, who obviously oh, know yeah. I am very attached to. <laughs> And she gets like a passing mention, yeah. but it's like about like her like sex drive in the sentence. And I'm just like, someone has been reading way too many men's histories and interpretations of Catherine the Great. Like if everything that you can say about her is distilled down to blah, 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 and her sex drive. I'm just like... And so it was, and it's literally like a sentence. Oh, I had, I had a very similar moment when I got to that <laughs> bit and I was like, oh, Brittany, you'll be so happy. Oh, she will not be happy. No, I'm like trying to see if I can find the exact like page. Hold on. I'm going into the index to see <laughs> if I can find it. But I was just like, why would you do that? I was very upset. I'm trying to see. It was, some, and it's early in the book too, because yes. obviously she's yeah. eight. So it's, so they're talking about the enlightenment. And then it says, of all the women involved in the Enlightenment, one of the most active was the mighty Russian Empress Catherine the Great. As intellectually voracious as she was sexually passionate. I'm just like, why? Why, <laughs> why does that have to get brought into it? And I'm also just like, I don't know. I'm just like, she had a few lovers, one of which they believe was actually married to her in secret because they believe Potemkin and her were actually married. Like there is like she refers to him as husband in letters and things like that. So they assume it was her husband. And I'm just like, she had maybe a handful of lovers, two of whom were her husband. So I'm just like, just take, I just wanted to like, scratch that line out so much because I'm like why you're talking about her as an enlightened figure and you have to throw in her voracious sexual appetite which is debatable so I had that moment and I, would, you, would you do the same if it was I got you yeah it's just like would you? oh yeah I'm like no you would not so I was just like as much as I was like this is and I'm like holding it in the wrong part of the screen as much as this is like a feminist interpretation of history and reading of history I'm just like why would you and it, it's like obvious to me that like Russian history is not her strong suit like this is she kind of I feel like you couldn't mention the enlightenment and not mention Catherine the Great at, when you're doing a women's history but I'm also just like no if you're gonna, <laughs> if you're gonna you. do it do it right <laughs> um so there was definitely that moment where I was like I practically wanted to like throw the book across across the room and just be like I hate you, um, but I got over it. Um, but I thought what was interesting um, and kind of continued to come up, and it I feel like it's all it's history continuing to repeat itself is this talk of like birth control and like contraception and things, which they started talking about in like the 19th century sections. Um, and then it kind of comes back once we're in the 20th and 21st century and just talking about like women trying to gain their equality with men and this like discourse of like how can women be equal if they don't even have control or autonomy over their bodies and things like that. And reading about the various women who like were trying to help in whatever medical ways they could, like in the 19th century, which were pretty archaic, obviously, and then moving along to everything that was happening kind of in the feminist movement in the first half of like the 20th century. I thought it was interesting because especially now in the United States, when a lot of those laws that have been in place are being brought into question again, it's 
it's history repeating itself. Like it happened in the 19th, it happened in the 20th, it's about to happen again in the 21st. So that to me definitely struck a chord um, and was just really fascinating overall because I didn't know anywhere near as much of some of the like fun factoids about like contraception and birth control before like the pill came into existence. So that was fascinating to me. Yeah. I think it's interesting because you've got, I think you last major, um, major like campaigning, I think they'd probably put it around the sixties and the mm-hmm. introduction of the pill. And yeah. it's interesting that these conversations uh, and debates are stirring up now. And it's like, well, that's because a lot of people who remember this have died and are not yeah. here to actually give their real life experience of what it is like to not have that kind of access anymore. Yeah. Um, people don't don't learn don't learn no they don't learn they do not learn Uh, but no it's 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 yeah frustrating to read knowing that that's that is going on and well then i'm Uh, like hoping and fingers crossed that nothing similar yeah um, makes its way across this way but yeah we've got all of us we've got our own issues as well when it comes to (laughs) we we definitely do. Um, and I actually, I feel like she did a pretty good job of exploring sort of those um, female sexuality sections of the book that really have to do with um, that body autonomy that we're talking about. Like knowing, like considering what I've read by her in fiction, I I would have assumed she would have been more comfortable kind of in the earlier histories because basically everything I've read from her has been medieval. Um, But I do feel like she was pretty strong um, and made some salient points um, about reproductive rights for women over the course of the last like 150, 200 years. Yeah, because I hadn't looked, um, I've not read any of her fiction and I um, not gone back to have a look at what her previous books were like. I was going to ask um, (laughs) what kind of her what kind of periods is she looking at in? Do you think that correlates yeah. with what she's But it seems... seems no, like- it really doesn't. I mean, I know she... I ha- This is the first of her nonfiction. I'm actually going to see what... If I can see her list of nonfiction. So she does have... She actually has the fiction of sex. Themes and function of sex difference in the modern novel. So maybe that is why. Because it might be something that she has, is actively like interested in but a lot of her fiction the ones that i've read um she had a guinevere trilogy which is like authorian legend she had an is old trilogy um and she also has a a rather thick novel on um elizabeth one which i think i still own i think i don't i don't think i have any of the other books because i read them when i was a teenager um but but yeah, so maybe that's why, like maybe she has a particular interest, but I know some of her nonfiction is like Ben Johnson. So I would definitely think she's more your part of the world when it comes to history than she is mine, but I have read several of her books. So I don't, so yeah, so I don't know, but I, I, I was very interested in it. Um, overall, I, I do wish there were certain things that were a little bit more fleshed out, I think, as I've already kind of established, but I did, I did enjoy it. I, th- I think it, it read really quickly considering that it's pretty, like it's a pretty straightforward history. Mm, definitely. Yeah. yeah. You've, got, you've got this like forward motion, this, she, she's mm-hmm. pulling you through each thing and it doesn't feel you, like you are getting bogged down in any one topic or one person mm-hmm. too long, even if it does, even if she does like weight things a little bit more towards the later periods, I felt like yeah. we were constantly moving um, at a at a rapid pace, but like able to where I was able to like have a stop and sing "Don't Cry for Me, Argentina" or <laughs> think about "Call the Midwife" while we get to the contraception section. Yes, yes. Down to, down to Nabby when she talks about Mary Stopes. Yes, <laughs> Mary. Stopes. I definitely, I feel like my point of reference for Mary Stopes is definitely Down Abbey. Like as much as I've heard the name and like it yeah. came up in my studies, like why did it stick in my brain? Because of Lady Mary. <laughs> Naturally. 
Um, but yeah, no, that was yes. that that was always fun. I also I actually thought that some of I feel like some of the other parts of the the narrative that really drew me in were in the modern section when they were looking at like Hollywood and mm-hmm. in particular like the media today. Um, and I mean, I'm a huge classic film nut. So I had a ton of fun when she was talking about Mae West. And like, I know some of those quotes from movies. And so I could literally hear her saying them in her vo- in her so- somewhat sultry voice. Um, but she lingered on Mae West for quite a while, which I was just like, I'm a little surprised that like, we've gotten so much on Mae West because it was a few pages, I felt like. Um, but I, I enjoyed that. And then even as I start talking about the media and they talk about like someone like Princess Diana, which I thought was was interesting how they kind of, how she attached it to, she I think the section is called mass hysteria, but she's really talking about mass media um, and the effect. She knows how to pull in her audience. She knows that yes. there are a lot of people over there. Uh, well, probably over your way too, who are going to be like, yeah. Die, die, die. Yes. Um, but no, I, I, speaking um, of the Hollywood section, I think I, I it got me very excited for uh, one of many birthday books, which is Women vs. <laughs> Hollywood. Um, oh, yay. Very you specific, have to... like, like a uh, hundred year look at women's experiences working in the film industry. So that made me like really want to pick that up. I think that this is what this book is really good for, is giving mm-hmm. you like, a jumping off point to bigger topics that you can explore yeah. in more detail. and like for some of them I was thinking oh like when she's talking about Mary Wollstonecraft and I was thinking oh mm-hmm. well definitely if you enjoy that section then you can go to like Romantic Outlaws or, yep. or um, the 50,000 billion books on the Brontes and Jane Austen that yeah. you can read and other people but then uh, what do, I'm trying to remember what the bibliography okay. section looks like I mean, she's got yeah. a decent amount of stuff in there um, yeah for like what you could do for you're forever reading. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it is kind of, it, I didn't really look at the suggested further reading section. Hey, I see Unwomanly Face of War listed here. That was one of my favorite books of last year. So that's exciting. Yeah, I do think it, it is really good way to sh- see what you're actually interested in. Because if there was a particular... Um, like person or a particular point in history hi Steph um then you you kind of could just know oh I'm gonna take a bunch of books when we did talk about Mary Wollstonecraft I'm like I have yet to read Romantic Outlaws which is on that shelf over there um I I need to get to it (laughs) ASAP it's it's, I mean it's a it's a a massive book but it's it is worth it I feel like that's that's part like last year was my big book quota which it does not exist um but my big book quota as it were was like the nine outlander books so it's like I haven't really picked up that many tomes so far this year but I do like a chunky book so I was just like I need to pick that one up at some point um but I think that was that would be a good book and I'm trying to think because there were a few others that I was just like oh you could read like I should read this book um the, the old Hollywood one, I have a couple books, not specifically on women in Hollywood, but just on like classic Hollywood in general that I'm like, oh, I should read that. And there's like a new book that just came out that's on Vivian Lee and Laurence Olivier. And I'm like obsessed and now need to go buy this book. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, Brittany, you don't need more books. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I do think it, it gives you that opportunity to actually see what what's what and what you're interested in overall. I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> no, one of the, I think when I got, to, when, when we start moving into, uh, with this into like the 1970s, 1980s, mm. I feel at so many points, she's dangling the Thatcher carrot and then quickly mm-hmm. takes it away. And I'm like, we know that you've got to get there. Yeah, we know that there is going to be a point of reckoning where you have to talk about her, and you could feel she really doesn't want to. And like me as a reader, I really don't want to, but you have to. Yeah, I'm northern, so I'm very biased against. Yeah, it's 
but it was it was I just found it so funny the amount of times it she kind of like teased on the edge of getting in there yeah. I was like no 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 no, no. like I don't want to get I don't want to touch it but um it's interesting about like, the way that she deals with women who are so influential but you can tell she doesn't really like but she you can't you can't do a history yeah of, of women without talking about her um, no. and other and other like very prominent women in politics yeah um, but no I, I thought it was funny I don't know if there were any others that you, <laughs> you I don't know if, I don't know if there was anyone like I definitely noticed the like mention Thatcher tease Thatcher then kind of back away um but I didn't think there was anyone else that I, I had that kind of sense that feeling of but I do like that she brought up other like women in politics and that it wasn't it didn't just become like the margaret thatcher show yeah. um which i feel like a lot of times it can be when you sort of look at like the history of women in politics um she can because she was so prominent because she was the prime minister of the uk it's like yeah but there were women in other parts of the world who became prime minister and who were in charge of governments um before thatcher mm -hmm. um and just because we're like western world focused none of us like they don't get their kind of moment and i feel like she did a good job about bringing up some of them um like she brought up indira gandhi which i was just like thank you because i feel like no one really talks about her um and then oh my god why am i blanking on what's her name i'm blanking but there she was trying to think it was a while ago i watched literally watched a documentary on her probably last year and now it's gonna bug me so i'm scrolling i'm i'm gonna look through the book and see if she pops up where's the, where the women in power women in power where art thou um, i looked out her entire section for that though was i think it would be room at the top um, yeah i like i like that that section is some like it called yeah well <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to see who because i like again because i didn't realize it was so it would go up to like We've got pretty um that yeah mel demarcus um i think that was who, that was who it was which i don't know why i could not remember um but there was also um the I think she was the prime minister of Ceylon, like in the 60s, mm -hmm. that I had never heard of her, but I was like, okay, good. At least we're bringing up these other women because like I said, a lot of times the politics angle, Margaret Thatcher looms pretty significantly. And it's just like, she was not exactly trying to help other women to the top. <laughs> like like this, this was not her concern. Um, and so, yeah, so it's like, let's, let's she, give credit. She climbed to up that ladder and she took it up. <laughs> yeah. She was just like, oh, okay. She's like, you're, you're going to need to jump a few hundred feet if you want to uh, get to my level. The section that, um, oh no, I, when we were talking about sections that kind of stuck in your brain and you were like, I've, I've just stumbled across, uh, one of them in the room, room at the top section, which is, uh, clam, clam power, oh. where she talks about, um, kind of like these political dynasties these families who um yeah. who repeatedly have power and she ends it by saying will Ivanka Trump become the first yes I was like no no no, no. I, don't I, do I was like don't please don't and then let's that. go on to the next section whilst we've horrified you I'm like literally <laughs> terrified us um as but, liberal minded people so I was just like then, no but then I was like, she 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 probably wrote it pre pre twenty twenty election. So maybe yeah. she's changed her mind on how what the possibility is. But who knows? Who knows? I have no idea no. what's going on. Apparently, it was published in the UK in twenty twenty, and it was published here in twenty twenty one. Cool. So I I'm I'm assuming they didn't make oh, like know. they didn't make any major revisions between okay. those two points um but i did i because i was i always like troll the reviews that other people give after i've given my review because i'm just like i don't want anyone to inform like my opinion on the book preemptively but it was really funny because like 
it got some low ratings from some people because they were like upset at how obviously liberal she was and there's just like if you like trump you should not read this book and it was just like well i i mean i don't i'm just like i don't I don't disagree. That's, that's an endorsement but, for me. <laughs> but, but I'm also like, but this, like, the book itself, like, that is such a very, very small part of the book. Like, literally gets brought up at the very end. There's so much else. So I'm just kind of like, okay. But I do remember seeing a few reviews that did not take too kindly to those sections that it got brought up. So I was like, oh, I, okay. But also, like, I, I don't know how you would write this book from a perspective that would appease Trump supporters, to be honest with you. Like, uh, I don't know. How, how do you twist that into, okay, Goodreads does not want to tell me when this book was, what month this book was published. So. <laughs> it's speaking up on me on my phone and on my, Maybe oh, oh, maybe maybe if I go on the story graph, because I use the story graph more. Okay. No, it doesn't tell me. Library. It does not tell me. It just says 2021, and I'm like, Thanks, but I want to know what year. Da, 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 da. But yeah, no, so I, so well, I thought that... It's now in my head, so I have to find out. Yeah, I'm like, I'm trying to look. Because the average rating on StoryGraph is 3.63. 3.63. That's... I mean... Yeah. 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 It's not it's not an endorsement, but it's not a yeah no either. Um okay, so this I've got a I've got a date of the 30th of April, so probably Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So a lot of what happened it's still kind of open ended. But yeah, so I really I honestly did not realize the book was as current as it was. Um I did not realize it had been published in like in the last year or two. I, yeah. So, th so that was that was a nice surprise to me. Um, another section that I would say actually stuck out a bit, even though it's probably like trigger warning e, but is the talk of the FGM, which, like, I I figured it would have to come up at some point because of how much of like the 19th century was talking about reproductive rights. Um, but that's something that I really have not seen covered in most histories that I've read, um, especially not sort of in the more modern context, which is where this took place. It was like talking about the um, the sort of protests and outspoken individuals in the 21st century that have, have really opened up and laid bare this conversation of what it is and what it is like to have experienced it or to be um, within a society or culture that expects it of women. So that to me was kind of a, a little bit like the foot binding thing where it gave more information than I think I have ever had on it previously. So it's one of those, it's one of those topics where like I, I mainly interact with it through like podcast discussion mm -hmm. or like it's never some, or something like this where it's just like it's a section Mm -hmm. section of a chapter in a book where but I've never delved into it as a full thing because mm -hmm. I, I I know it'll just upset me yeah um and like the same thing with a lot of like hard-hitting topics like um like sexual assaults and things I don't I, I I'm like I know I should read upon a lot more about it but it's gonna just yeah be a bit a bit too hard-hitting for me um yeah. and it's just yeah it was definitely a section that I was like, I, I yeah, just it, like, yeah, it was hard hitting, um, although I think she did it well. She yeah. didn't, it did like, I don't think at any point she became overly graphic about anything. Um, but you understood the point that she was getting across, which I appreciated. So that was another section that I would say really stuck out to me and was very different from what I normally read um, and from anything that has ever been addressed in a class that I've taken. So that was that was interesting and compelling to me. Um, and I would say too, like any of the sections where they were talking about like 
women being involved in war efforts was also just really interesting because I think probably until I started actively like reading a lot of books about women at the front, like the impression was that women were always like if they were at the front, they were nurses, like they were Florence Nightingale type figures, which they do bring Florence Nightingale up. And I, I actually thought yeah, it was it, <laughs> it was kind of it was kind of funny because I was just like you're not, I feel like you're not giving her too much credit for what she accomplished, but okay. Um, it was a very brief, brief section. Um, but you do, I feel like the general sort of conception or misconception about women in war efforts is like, they were nurses and they were like doing things at home and like not involved in the war efforts. And she alludes to and references women who were actively part of the conflict i mean that's the main thing that you you often hear from people from uh people who are like oh well women if you want equality then why don't you fight as well i was like okay number one are you right now fighting mm-hmm. who is telling you that you have to fight and number two yeah. they were yeah yeah and a lot of the reason and a lot of the reason that they weren't is because they there were laws against it so it's yeah. not really a us having to get off of our bums in go fight that was never the issue (laughs) no that was never the issue um but it it was interesting um seeing some of that brought up and then even some of the mentions and conversations about like the spies which i always like a good spy spy section so they like brought up virginia hall which i read a woman of no importance and absolutely loved that biography um so I was just like, yeah, that's really, really good um, to see her brought up. But then talking about some of like the Cold War, War spies, which I've heard of, but not in any detail. And now all of a sudden I was like, I want to learn more about them. Mm-hmm. I think the one figure that now, because I just brought up a woman of no importance that I'm surprised didn't really get mentioned or mentioned that I recall was Clementine Churchill. Hmm. I don't remember her getting mentioned at all, which, like, I would, like, as far, like, she wasn't obviously an elected member of politics, but she did play yeah, no small role <laughs> in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and that just came to mind because Sonia Purnell wrote a Winston, Winston, yes. Come to you now. No, which I'm just like, it's a women's history and you bring up the her husband and not Clementine so if there's any woman in here that I feel like got left out it would be Clementine um just like off the top of my head because the other like I feel like mostly everyone else that I could think of did get brought up like off the top of my head Mm. I think the perfect thing for me it would have been like because this is where my brain always is is it would like women writers who like mm-hmm. Aust- Jane Austen obviously gets brought up the Brontes get brought mm-hmm. up but yeah uh, especially having read uh that just gone through the uh the book the bookish broads book um yeah like, but you could also have gone for this person then. did Virginia Woolf get brought up <laughs> sorry that was very high <laughs> <laughs> someone's a soprano I'm, now I'm looking in the the index again how, how do you know how do you know somebody is a soprano <laughs> I will let you if know. they, can, if they no. can hit that note um no which that to me seems like a big oversight yeah how do you how do you not bring them hmm, okay so we have a couple so we have, we've thought of two figures what other writers were you thinking of uh, i mean there's a whole pantheon of uh, victorian yeah. writers who i'm just yeah. like and her, and her, and her. Yeah. Um, Mary Shelley gets brought up in re- somewhat in relation yeah, to her it, mother. Yeah, it's in relation to Mary, which I, I, I guess is a nice refresher, refreshing thing because usually it's Mary Wollstonecraft being brought up in relation to Mary Shelley. Yes. Um, so there is still, that. But still, I'd, I'd always want more Mary Shelley. Um, yeah. Who else? Who else? I mean, it's just. I, I guess I guess the issue is it's going she's going who is being a rebel and who is just you know just yeah. very influential and I guess yeah. that's the distinction she has to make is yeah like you've got figures like 
Agatha Christie who are defining an entire genre, mm-hmm. but is she, is she a rebel? Rebel, yeah. Which I mean, that makes sense, especially because the book in the UK is called Rebel Women. But yeah. here in the US, it, this is about radicals, history. radical, it's about how radicals, rebels, and every women. So, like, it could, like, based on the title of this book in the US, it could, mm-hmm. like, they could have been included. Um, surprisingly they did they did bring up well not surprisingly they brought up victoria obviously but she's not exactly an advocate for women's mm. rights in the 19th century which I always makes me giggle they were talking about um about women's rights in in the victorian period and i was like wait for it wait, wait, right wait, wait. and it it's always it always makes me giggle a little bit because you're just like she is literally a woman ruling an empire and she I have many and she's opposed. I could have with with Queen Victoria and just like, like and yet it's just like and yet this is like something to, she's very opposed to and I'm just like okay but and I mean like part of me just considering when this book is written I'm like surprised I don't re- recall any mention of like Elizabeth II Although obviously she's a figurehead now, yeah. like she's the longest reigning monarch in British history, is she? <laughs> so it was kind of like and she's like two. She's two years off, like longest reigning ever. Yeah, and yeah. So two years. Yeah. So I'm just like, so even if she just got like a mention, I'm like, you mention catherine the great and her sex drive but you can't mention elizabeth ii being the longest reigning monarch in the context of rebel women yeah she's not a rebel she's She's not not. she's not a rebel no but in the context of every woman i mean she's not technically an every woman um she's a freaking queen but i just noticed who was not in here who um, is frida Kahlo, who i feel like in terms of political like art um, oh that is I'm like i would have i would have put her in as a as a, like one of the most famous artists yeah that... when did artemisia gentileschi that might have been a little bit earlier because if not when did she's considered baroque yes no so that would have been a little bit early i suppose uh... Yeah. I don't really remember them mentioning many artists. Art, period. Yeah. Like I like Me, they talk I about like you it, why not? <laughs> like I can I can like they talked about some writers, they talked about actors, they talked about like TV personalities. But yeah, I like I mean even like I'm thinking about it like I don't feel like fashion was really brought up. No. And like I feel like, I mean, I don't know if I'd consider Chanel a, a rebel, um, but I think, I think <laughs> in terms of her silhouette, of yeah, her living, but less so in her politics, right? <laughs> less so in her politics. Her politics can be very problematic, um, but like as far as like, I feel like that it was almost like a missed opportunity because you're talking about like body autonomy, and I know there were sections on like the brazier and the corset. And those things, and you don't talk about like one of the women who changed this, like the silhouette yeah. of women's fashion. Like, with that, you've then got the if you're talking Chanel and the silhouette that she popularized, you've then got to go into the new look, which isn't, which is for maybe. women, but, it, but it's the or. Yeah. Popularize that. So maybe, maybe, maybe. Thought, maybe she thought, let's not. Let's yeah, let's not go there. It's not, it's not fueled entirely by a female designer. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. But yeah, so we thought of a few people. Which has now made me think of, um, I've uh, received a book for my birthday, which I don't have with me because it got sent to my home address. Oh no! But it's fine, it's fine. I'll I'll be there in six weeks, it's fine. (laughs) It's it's called Dress Like a Woman and it's about 20th century. Uh, It's all, it's like a photography book mainly. I don't think there's much writing in it, but it's um, just women at work in any field that you Mm -hmm. can work. So I think the thing that drew me to it was there was a there were pictures of uh, the America uh, dancing West Side Story, and I was oh. like, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, but it's also you know just uh, like like um, 
female pilots, female mm-hmm. factory workers, office mm-hmm. workers, and it's just going through the century of these women and what they wore to do yeah. their professions. Um, yeah. And it's like a very simple concept, but I love like the, the range that I saw when I flipped through it. So I will read that at some point and then be able to speak more about yeah, it. But I guess, right. I guess that's, um, that's, my, that's my suggestion for remedying the lack of yeah, fashion. Uh, fashion and art discussion. Yeah. I mean, in thinking too, because your cover, we've talked about a few times, your cover and this woman with the tight lacing that would put Scarlett O'Hara's waistline to <laughs> shame. Like, I don't know. I have always been one of those people who is fascinated by the concept of corsets. And actually Fast Company put like an interesting article out recently talking about like the misconceptions about corsets because of Bridgerton. And I'm just like, they're Regency era. What cor- like what sort of tight corsets yeah. are they wearing anyway? Like- um, but like down, down always, he's loose and flowy. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm, I'm just like, why are they wearing they're, 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 full? But then, but then, have you have you been have you been watching season two? Yeah, I, I binged yeah. it last weekend. <laughs> so there is there is a, a, a scene that is a spoiler, but th- there yeah. is a scene and they show that she's wearing a half, yeah, a half outfit and her midriff is on her. Um, yeah, but then the rest of the time they're showing them in like these full corsets, which is like yeah. Hmm. Which, hmm. which it was like a, an article talking about, I think, I think they said what Bridgerton got wrong about corsets or something. Um, but it like, there's always with these big, like period costume things are always like these one or two actresses who are just like, oh my God, I wore the corset and it like changed my body shape or yeah. it was so uncomfortable <laughs> and I c- couldn't breathe. And it's just like, literally corsets were, were like, they weren't. Like, unless you were tight lacing, they were an undergarment like a bra. bra. Like, yeah, we don't like wearing bras. Most of us are happy when we can take them off. Um, But, like, unless you were tight lacing yourself, like, it wasn't, like, it wasn't meant to suffocate you. There are plenty of women doing things in them. So I'm just, it's always just really funny when, like, modern... It's my one major criticism of Pirates of the Caribbean, which is a perfect, flawless movie, and I love it yeah. very much. Is, is <laughs> with, course, it's, it's when she's like, <gasps> fall over. And I'm just like, no, that's not that how it works. That was my first introduction to Corsets was Pirates of the Caribbean, so that's a... <laughs> I think my first <laughs> I in- introduction was Gone with the Wind and Scarlett O'Hara, but ah, she was yeah. literally being tight uh, laced. Have you seen Meet Me in St. Louis? Yes. Uh, it's that, that scene where Judy Garland is just like, oh, oh. Yeah, I'm just like, really just wearing this thing. Um, but no, no. I am. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's always a, a very funny conversation because it's either, for me, I'm like, either they've been doing it too tight, which I completely believe in, in, um, in these films and TV. Yeah. Which I can completely, completely believe because of what the body figure ideal is yeah. um, for these actresses. Um, or they've been wearing ones that haven't been properly fitted made for them. them. Yeah. Because if it's fitted for you, it should be... not be an issue. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, like, they're meant to support you and also support, especially if you're wearing something from like the 18th century, it's meant to support yeah. the rest of the clothing that you're wearing that is big and bulky and heavy and you need yeah. support. It's right supposed here. to like help your back. Like it's about like these gowns that people were wearing probably weighed 30, 40 pounds on the light side some of these big evening gowns yeah. so it i mean it's meant to be supportive and i'm just like yeah so it was an interesting article i can share the link with anyone who is interested yeah. um but yeah so we have had conversations about the tight laced woman on the cover of a book titled rebel women because we're like that is the opposite in my mind like they're two separate things <laughs> i do quite like that um that she's kind of trying to phase it yeah. into like a modern day yeah um, with, with like it's going into color around the arms and yeah she's very clearly wearing like a red t-shirt yes yes um, so I, I do like that, that. trying to trying to evoke that and I'm I'm glad it is that rather than like she's ripping off her corset and I'm like throwing, yeah throwing it away I'm, like she's a, she's wearing it she's yeah she's wearing, she's wearing it. it she's wearing it she's, she's tightly still able to rebel her waist her waist looks like it's about six she's inches so tiny. Oh so tiny but yeah so we've had tons of conversations about that um 
but yeah, no, it, it's just always really fascinating to me when those articles come out. But I, with Bridgerton, especially, I was just like, your Regency era, with the exception of, oh my God, what is the Featherington, the mother, yeah. that I'm just like, what are you wearing? I'm like, uh, I, I do love, I, I, I love, they've, they've, especially this season, they've just been like, we're not going to, we, I mean, I'm very defensive of Bridgerton because I know the historical advisor, um, Hannah Gregg, is actually um, worked. Uh, she's she's a lecturer at my university. Oh, that's so cool! And I think she's. I think I've never been taught by her. I've been like very close to being taught by her, but then yeah. it, she's always on film sets doing something. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, I have like an academic crush on her. I think she's yeah, great. That's fair. That's um, fair. So I'm like, I know that any decision they make would be stylistic choices mm-hmm. rather than them just not caring about the history. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm. I'm. So I. But I do love. <laughs> It's got a prop that the Fefferingtons just have this proper, especially Lady Fefferington, she just has this proper like 60s yeah. meets like the stepmother from Cinderella. Yes, it, I've actually like, seen a meme putting her and the two elder daughters on top of like a picture of Kate Blanchett yes. and um, the evil stepsisters. And I'm just like, it's the same color palette. It, I don't hate it. I'm not going to lie. It kind of <laughs> gives me life. Um, but yeah, so. <laughs> We do think this book needs more art and fashion is basically where I mean, you don't, there's no there isn't even like little photo section no. in the middle. Like, I mean I I am not a fan I, of, uh, of just dumping your photos in the middle of the book. No. I Which, like she it. has a few but not too many so I didn't mind it too much. I like I like yeah so you've got your, your black and white illustrations peppered yeah. throughout rather than the yeah. big contour. But what I like is a nice is a nice color photo that is integrated with with the text that's my favorite thing in history books yeah i think it helps do it and i know it probably makes production more expensive and it means the book is going to be more expensive but i love it and it, i think it opens up i think yeah. it opens up the world for people especially if they're, they're new to a period to just yes. love new things rather yeah. than to try and imagine it and yeah i, I, love, I like photos i like pictures so much <laughs> I, I, I do too i do too Um, So, I mean, I guess this is where we put our final thoughts on the book. What do you, what do you think? Yes. So, like, definitely things that it's lacking. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think for what she's going for, Mm -hmm. I think she's successful in that. There are definitely, like, quibbles that I have, Mm -hmm. but I enjoyed it. Um, And, like, I can see myself going back to it and, like, pick it because I, I have I did this morning I was having, <laughs> um, and it didn't feel like a slog or like oh this bit again because yeah. you are just zipping so quickly through these different people yeah um and I think like like we keep on saying it's a really good jumping off point to um to learning about other people yeah and I don't know if maybe if we do if we're if we are doing history on next year we might go for something that's more in depth about one person or mm-hmm. a group of people yeah, um, I think it's this this for like a first go at um, yeah of history. I yeah, like a I nice think... way of sink, sinking into it and uh, yeah, and especially because modern history is not my my like I know I know I know things I know things that happened yeah, but it's not my area. Right, right. Uh, so it's nice to get like a whistle stop tour via these women, which is my favorite way of learning. <laughs> Yeah, about the past is, is <laughs> what women would do. Yes, no, I, I think, I think I, I have quibbles with it too, but nothing that's like so awful that I would like discourage people from reading it. I think if you're into like history or want to learn more of like sort of the women's movement throughout time, this is great. I do see myself like referring to this um, again and again. But for me, I think what is the most helpful is the suggested further reading section in the back, because I'm already like looking and being like, oh, that actually sounds interesting. Um, so I might need to actually give that a closer inspection and see if there are any books to add to my TBR, mm-hmm. because I think I think there will be. So to me, it's it's definitely a good reference book yeah and with that in mind uh what is what do you think is going to be your next 
the book that you'd want to pick up that is on the history of theme, even though we're, we're out of it Ooh. now? Well, um, it's actually funny because one of the, the book that I'm reading right now, which I meant to read for her story a thon, but didn't get around to it. So I'm reading it for Linguathon, which is my okay. other readathon, is The Diaries of Sophia Tolstoy. Oh, so I'm I'm currently reading that and I'm approaching it in the same way that I've approached like War and Peace and Anna Karenina, which is like, okay, I give myself X number of days to read it. And so I have to read like however many pages. Um, so I'm reading like 20 to 25 pages a day of it. So I'm not very far in, um, but I'm already fascinated. It's definitely going to be like a very niche book. Um, and from what I'm like so far reading, it's one of those books that I feel like you kind of need to have some historical context because it doesn't provide a ton of it. Like there might be like a little paragraph blurb at the start of like a particular year saying these are a couple of things that happened. Um, like so and so tried to assassinate the czar, or like they happen like the Tolstoys had a kid. Um, but it 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 helps to have my historical background in this particular time period to understand what's going on and to also be someone who is like actively like girl crushing on Sophia Tolstoy at the time. Because bear in mind it is a diary. So it wasn't meant to be like it's not meant for public consumption. So it's like, it's her personal thoughts. There's no like plot to it. And occasionally it's like, it's a little repetitive because she's pissed off at Tolstoy nine times out of 10. So when she's not, I'm so madly in love with him. She's like, I want to pull my hair out. He's horrible. So <laughs> you, you just kind of got to go with it. But um, I'm looking forward to getting a little bit further in it because it is, sure it is quite a tall. for so many women. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> It is, it is what it is. It's it's a diary. So it's very personal. And I'm like, if you read my diary, it, I'm sure a lot of it is going to be me cursing the same people over and over again, because they, <laughs> they're the people in my inner circle. And they're the ones that can anno annoy me the most. But yeah, so I'm, that's the one I'm currently reading, um, and trying to finish up a well behaved woman, which is on mm -hmm. Elva um, Vanderbilt, which was also a historiathon book for me. So I have those two going. And that one I'm actually enjoying quite a bit. Um, I would say, like, if you liked Gilded Age, the TV show, definitely give this a try because I knew Bertha Russell and the Russells in general were based on the Vanderbilt, but the parallels between Alva Vanderbilt and Bertha are like crazy and some of the like the McAllisters and Astors that fi figure in Gilded Age the TV show are here too so it it's been it's been interesting to um read that which is more of a traditional novel than anything else um but what about you what's next I was I was going to say um re Gilded Age is that I I've watched the first episode now when I've been back yeah now. I have now worked out a way that I can watch it from my laptop which is good Yay! Uh, through Sky Go, woohoo! Thank you for my thoughts. <laughs> Sky. Um, so no, and they were my my mum was laughing at me for the amount of times the, as I was doing to you whilst I was watching it of being like this person's in it, this person's in it, this Broadway person's in it. Yes, all the Broadway um, people. And she, because my mum didn't, like, my mum um isn't quite as obsessive about musical theatre as I am like she goes to see stuff that's but fair. she's not like she doesn't know like who all the people are and especially like Broadway people yeah um, that's why I was pointing out like oh she was in Great Comet 1832 and she was in the thing he's like oh really this person can sing oh amazing um <laughs> she, was, she was more excited about do you know that that's Meryl Streep's daughter is the mm -hmm. singer and I was like oh I did not know that so we brought we brought something together yeah. to it yeah no <laughs> no, but no uh so i need to i need to delve into those a little bit more mm -hmm. um but in, in terms of books um so it was just my birthday and purchases <laughs> happened <laughs> purchases uh, both, happened both, both things that people got me which was very very lovely and also mm -hmm. things that i bought for myself because i have no self-control fair um i think um I've got my, I, I got the Letters of Great Women, uh, which was, um, it's basically what it sounds like is you've got the, <laughs> you've got the um, historical letter, like a, a, a scan of it, a picture of mm -hmm. it on one side, and then you've got the transcript on the other side. Okay. So you can read um, what these fantastic ladies 
wrote to different people like it's like key letters from their okay. time and, and accompanied with like a little biography section of them okay um, and that's going from i believe from um ancient times to now okay um, i think there's the, i think there's even a letter that's greta thunberg so like oh, oh, cool i wonder if that's a tweet that's though i didn't look into that whoever it's a <laughs> um but that's where she's most prolific i suppose yeah <laughs> that would make more yeah. sense um, and would be very interesting on a technology conversation in terms of how we're able to uh, transmit our messages to people. So I've got True. that, which I'm looking forward to. The, the main issue with that is that it's a massive book that I yeah. can't sleep on the bus. I yeah. can try, but I think people would think I'm a bit extra. And I'm sure they Probably. already do. Um, I, I intend off fiction. I also, when I went to the Bronte Parsonage, got uh, a th historical fiction called Bronte's Mistress, which is about Bramwell. Oh, Bronte. I've seen this book. Um, Did I Bronte's... see this book on your feed? Was this why I saw this Maybe? book? It was I mean... in my book haul. So yes, it yeah. must have been you. Um, but no, it sounds it. very familiar. Yeah, I'd seen, basically, I'd seen it on Scribd as an audiobook, and since uh... buying it, it's not there anymore, which I'm very cross about because. Oh, that's weird. I love an audiobook. I like Ooh. reading them too, but it's always nice to have like that as an option yeah. uh, when you're not able to read. Um, but no, all about uh, her experience as his mistress and especially after his death as, you know, she was somebody who was so important in his life and was like th the next most important person, but not having any rights because she wasn't married, married to him legal, mm -hmm. legally. Um, and I think it's like her experiences with the family um so having gone to having gone to Haworth and like being able to walk around there um oh that was a question did you do any um did you do any um sightseeing or going to places I did not because I am just lazy so most <laughs> like I live in an area that is very steeped in like American revolutionary history but like all of it has to do with like general so and so happened to stay under this roof at this particular time sort of sort of stuff um and so i would have probably liked to have gone into the city to do a few things um because there are quite a few like monuments in central park to various women um there are quite a few buildings that were constructed by these influential women or influenced by but I just did not get into the city because it has been cold and wet and while the UK is used to that I'm like no let me hide in my bed with my hot cocoa so we've, no. had, we've had a very weird couple of weeks because when I went home for my birthday it mm -hmm. was glorious sunshine and oh. like didn't have to wear my winter coat anymore and it was beautiful or, and I thought this will last for maybe a day or two and it didn't it was the entire week oh, and it was wow. only when I came back to Oxford that literally as we were driving down uh, it's like a three or four hour drive down and you could feel it getting colder and the sky getting darker and gloomier um, and then last week we had snow it's like yeah. What is this? It, the weather makes no sense. No, um, but no. When when I was back home, I went to Howarth. I went to Shibden Hall, which is where I was. I was showing Brittany, but for anybody else, I got a little Amlister. Yes, love it. it. I love the little top hat. <laughs> um, and went to York, and I found um, th there's um a, like a plaque up in York. Uh, it's like the first like LGBTQ plus plaque because it's got like the rainbow around it. Uh, yeah. plaque, which is commemorating that this is where Anne Lister got uh, had was recognized uh, her and her wife were were, were recognized at the church and um, or they took the sacrament together which was yeah not a proper legal marriage but it was they yeah. they saw it as such um, and that was that was really fun though I wasn't able to go properly in because it was shut on Monday Tuesday oh so I was like I had my arm out at the gate just trying to get a video of uh, <laughs> this plaque which I was just like so typical the day that I would go would be naturally um but then also really randomly at the end of uh, on Thursday so Thursday was the 31st wasn't it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um so it is currently um Oxford Literary F Festival oh um, well, it's I think it's just about finished um and we've had a bunch of authors in to do events and we had one who last minute cancelled and he had a non-refundable hotel room which my manager said does anybody want this 
and it's in Oxford, in central Oxford. And I said, well, I've got rehearsal in Oxford until 10. Could I maybe have it? Because then I don't have to worry about getting home. And she was like, yeah, totally. And it's, um, it was this hotel, which is basically, it's refurbished, one of one of Oxford Oxford's prisons refurbished, but it's right next to Oxford Castle and prison. So I think it's all mm. part of that, which is where famously Empress Matilda stayed and uh, and escaped oh from. wow um you must was, have been excited because i've been to oxford castle before and i yeah. knew like the history around that but i was like i'm sleeping somewhere where she may have been near oh. <laughs> it's like i'm breathing air that she breathed how many centuries ago <laughs> now years ago um, yeah Sorry, I was very excited about that. But also the room, you can tell it was a refurbished prison if you look on the photos of it. Um, and the room that the section I was in was this separate wing, which was the house of correction. So I'm like, okay. am I staying, am I staying in a room that used to be a torture chamber? I think I am. That's terrifying. Yeah. That's cool, like, but also terrifying. terrifying. I was like, am I going to be haunted whilst I sleep for all of the, the yeah. poor departed souls who were tortured in this room? I don't know. I hope mm -hmm. not. I hope not. It I sounds like you were enough. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's I, 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 um, I, chid my, I got in from rehearsal and I finished watching Bridgerton season two in my cozies. Just like, this is, this is the life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I binged that. In, like I think I started it Saturday and I watched I think like seven or eight episodes in a day and then I just had to watch like the last one um on Sunday because by the time I got to that episode it was like 1 a.m and I was like it is bedtime um you're an early riser I am an early riser I just to like I woke up before five today and I was like, okay, I guess it's time to read. Woman than I. I was like, I guess it's time to read. So that's exactly what I did. Um, but yeah, no. So no, no fun playing tourist and visiting anything historical um, this time around. But hopefully if we do do this in 2023, which is shocking that we're like thinking yeah. about 2023, yeah. um, definitely want to continue to have those activities and maybe take advantage of it a little bit more then yeah and hopefully we're at a we're at a point where you're not like semi-terrified of uh of going anywhere and catching it yeah yeah Which, that knows? we said that we we were probably saying things like that last year that in 2022 yeah. we'll be able to do loads of stuff and not worry about it so yeah it, it's 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 a vicious cycle unfortunately yeah. um, um but no it was it was good fun um and especially because that last one was just like a random thing that happened. Yeah. Um, but that, I suppose, is the beauty of England and of Oxford is that there are lots of places that you can just randomly stumble on that. Yeah. Like, ah, oh, this thing is 900 years old. Amazing. Yeah, then not so much of that around here, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess that's it. We've talked about the book. We've talked about various and sundry other things. Some more related to the book than not. Yeah. <laughs> But thank you to everyone who tuned in and read the group read and participated in the readathon. We appreciate it. And I guess that's the end of it. So thank you, Charlotte, for being here and co-hosting with me. It's been a wild ride. Thank you for asking. Because <laughs> when you did, I was like, yes, this is the readathon that I've been waiting for. <laughs> So yes, hopefully check back for her story a thon 2023. <laughs> Bye everyone. See you later. Okay. <laughs>